Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a physician talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. Please be seated. What's your problem? Well, I have been facing this problem with respect to tonsils for many years. I have throat pain. Do you feel any difficulty in swallowing? No, doctor. But I have got this habit of snoring loudly. Do you get sleep apnea episodes? No, doctor. Often, I am a mouth breather, especially at night times, doctor. What's your age? Seventeen. I had three bouts of tonsillitis this year. On an average, I get about four bouts of tonsillitis per year. Okay. Have you had any illness? treatments or surgeries earlier? Yes, I had a cholecystectomy. What medicines are you taking now? Nothing, doctor. Is there any family history of illness? Well, my sister has ear infection. Rest of my family members have history of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension. Well, your physical examination results show your pulse is 80 and regular. Temperature is 98.4. Weight is 184 pounds. Your tongue, lip, floor of mouth are noted to be normal. Oropharynx does reveal very large tonsils measuring 3 plus or 4 plus. They were exophytic. Mere examination of the larynx reveals some mild edemia of the larynx. You have enlarged tonsils. You have developed chronic andiotonsillitis with andiotonsillar hypertrophy, upper respiratory tract infection with mild acute laryngitis. You have obesity issue. I would recommend that you go for andinotonsillectomy. The risk may include bleeding, infection, scarring, regrowth of the andiotonsillar tissue. There may be need for further surgery persistent sore throat, voice changes, etc. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a new patient called Mrs. Delilah. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes.
Good morning, doctor. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, I have persistent mild weakness in the left leg and occasional off and on numbness in the left hand. I have shortness of breath often. Do you feel any weakness in your arm? No, doctor, but I am ambulating with a cane. Was there any history of falling down? No, doctor. I had repeat carotid dopplers and further imaging studies shows no further increased stenosis in my left internal carotid artery. Okay. What is your age? 51, doctor. You had any illness and treatments? Yes, I had cerebrovascular accident but got treated. What medications are you taking? Plavix, aspirin, levothyroxine, lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, Lasix, insulin, and simvastatin. Any allergies due to medications? No, doctor. Is there any history of illness of your family members? No, doctor. Well, your blood pressure is 170 over 66, heart rate 66, respiratory rate 16, your weight is 254 pounds, and your temperature is 98. Normal cephalic and atraumatic, no dry mouth, no palpable cervical lymph nodes, your conjunctiva and sclera were clear, your cranial nerves show mild decrease in the left nasolabial fold. There is a mild increased tone in the left upper extremity. Deltoid shows 5 over 5. The rest shows full strength. Hip flexion is 5 slash 5 on the left. The rest shows full strength. Reflexes were hypoactive and symmetrical. Your gait is mildly abnormal. No ataxia noted. Wide-based, ambulated with a cane. Status, post-cerebrovascular accident involving the right upper pons extending into the right cerebral pentacle with a mild left hemiparenthesis. Status, post-cerebrovascular accident involving the right upper pons extending into the right cerebral peduncle with a mild left hemiparesis has been clinically stable with mild improvement. For now, continue using antiplatelet therapy and statin therapy to reduce the risk of future strokes. Continue to follow with endocrinology for diabetes and thyroid problems. You must strictly control your blood sugar level, optimizing cholesterol and blood pressure control, regular exercise, and healthy diet. I am planning for surgical intervention for the internal carotid artery. This is the end of Part A. Now, look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at the question 25. You hear a discussion between a doctor and nurse about different types of blood tests for leukemia. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of blood tests for leukemia? Well, blood tests, such as complete blood count, can detect leukemia. 
A complete blood count determines the number of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Cytogenetics analysis is a blood test in which a sample of blood is examined to check for changes in the chromosomes of the lymphocytes. Peripheral blood smear determines the presence of blast cells and shows the type and quantity of white blood cells. Other various blood tests may be ordered to see how organs are functioning and if they are being affected by leukemia. Question 26. You hear a discussion about different types of melanoma. Now, read the question. There are four major types of melanoma that have the potential for metastitis with distinct characteristics. Lentigo maligna is often found on the head and neck region. Superficial spreading melanoma is more commonly found on the trunk, upper arms, and thighs, and is the most common form of melanoma in white races. Acrolatinganous melanoma is more commonly found on the hands, feet, and nail beds which is similar to latigo maligna and superficial spreading, in which it has a relatively long, flat phase before it penetrates into the deeper levels of the skin. Nodular melanoma can occur on any skin surface, but is found more commonly on the trunk, upper arms, and thighs. Question 27. You hear a discussion about lung cancer. Now... Read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of lung cancer? Squamous cell carcinoma, or epidermic carcinoma, usually starts in the bronchial tubes in the center of the lungs and can cause symptoms early on, especially hematypus. Large cell carcinoma often occurs in the outer regions of the lungs and tends to grow rapidly. Mesothelioma actually begins in the mesothelium, a membrane that surrounds the lungs. Small cell lung cancer usually grows in the central areas of the lungs, and most people have few symptoms until just before they are diagnosed. Lung carcinoid Lung carcinoid tumors are made up of cells called neuroendocrine cells. Question 28. You hear a discussion about non-inflamed comedones. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. Can you please explain to me what are non-inflamed comedones? With non-inflamed comedones, there will not be redness or swelling of the lesion. However, non-inflamed comedones may turn into a pimple when bacteria invade. Open comedones, or blackheads, is an accumulation of dead skin cells and sebaceous matter within the follicle. Soft closed comedones develop when a plug of cellulose debris and oil becomes trapped within the pore and are covered by a layer of dead skin cells. Hard closed comedone, called milia, have very obvious white hats, which is not pus but rather a mass of dead cells and sebum. Microcomedones occur when the sebaceous duct and pore opening becomes blocked by excess sebum and dead skin cells. Every blemish begins as a microcomedome. Question 29. You hear a question about acnes. Now read the question.
Hello, doctor. Could you explain to me what are acnes? Well, there are different types of acne, which are not just classified by its severity. Acne vulgaris can appear on the face, back, shoulders, and buttocks. If you break out, most likely it is the acne vulgaris comodomal acne. It appears as bumpiness, blackheads, which can occur anywhere on the face or body that can range from very mild to quite severe. Cystic acne is the most severe form of acne, which can occur anywhere on the face or body. Acne cysts occur deeper in the skin than the typical pimple, take weeks to heal, and can cause a lot of damage to the skin. Because they are so deep, topical acne treatments are not very effective. Instead, oral medications, like Accutane, are the best option. Nodule acne is another severe type of acne vulgaris. Acne rosacea is a type of acne that affects adults above 30 and occurs only on the face. Acne bachancia is caused when there is excess heat, pressure, or friction on the skin. This type of acne is most common on the body, but can also occur on the face. Acne cosmetica is caused by products like creams, makeups, and moisturizers, and even certain hair care products cause this type of facial acne. People with excoriated acne chronically and excessively pick at pimples to the point of causing wounds. Question 30. You hear a discussion about athlete's foot. Now, read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of athlete's foot? Athlete's foot is divided into three categories. Chronic, interdigital athlete's foot, chronic, scaly athlete's foot, and acute, vesticular athlete's foot. Chronic, interdigital athlete's foot is characterized by scaling, maceration, and fissures most commonly in the webbed spaces between the fourth and fifth toes. With this type of athlete's foot, itching is typically most intense when the socks and shoes are removed. Acute vesicular athlete's foot is the least common type of athlete's foot, caused by trichophyton mentagrophytes, that is characterized by the sudden onset of painful blisters on the sole or top of the foot. This type of athlete's foot is also caused by jungle rot a historically disabling problem for servicemen fighting in warm, humid conditions. Chronic scaly athlete's foot is caused by trichophyton rubrum. This dermatophyte causes dry, scaly skin on the sole of the foot. The hands may also be infected, although the usual pattern of infection is two feet and one hand, or one foot and two hands, and these are most commonly seen in patients with eczema or asthma. This is the end of Part B. Now, look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer, A, B, or C, which best fits according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at Extract 1. Extract 1, for questions 31 to 36. You hear the lecture given by a physician on the standard method of diagnosing attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. 
You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. The standard methods of diagnosing and assessing attention deficit hyperactivity disorder used by mental health professionals is application of the criteria established in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders that identifies three presentations of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Combined presentation, predominantly inattentive presentation, predominantly hyperactive impulsive presentation. Functional neuroimaging, such as SPECT scanning, is considered an effective tool for researchers. Type 1. Classic Attention Deficit Disorder People with classic attention deficit disorder have reduced blood flow in their brain area of the prefrontal cortex, cerebellum, and basal ganglia. The basal ganglia produces dopamine. Type 2. Inattentive Attention Deficit Disorder People with inattentive attention deficit disorder are often described as daydreamers, space cadets, and couch potatoes. This type is more common in girls than boys and is often diagnosed later in life because people with type 2 inattentive attention disorder don't have behavioral problems. People with this disorder have reduced activity in the prefrontal cortex as well as low levels of dopamine. Type 3 Overfocused Attention Deficit Disorder. People with overfocused attention deficit disorder have a deficiency of dopamine and serotonin. The aim of treatment is to increase both these neurotransmitters, the nervous system's chemical messengers. Type 4 Temporal Lobe Attention Deficit Disorder. People with this type might see or hear things that are not there, and learning and memory problems may be present. The patients will have irregularities in their temporal lobes and less activity in the prefrontal cortex part of the brain. The aim of treatment is to soothe neuronal activity and stop nerve cells from overfiring or firing unpredictably. Type 5 Limbic Attention Deficit Disorder People with limbic attention deficit disorder have excessive activity in the limbic section of the brain which is where moods are controlled. They have reduced activity in the prefrontal cortex, both when relaxing or focusing on a task. Type 6. Ring of Fire Attention Deficit Disorder People with Ring of Fire Attention Deficit Disorder have an overactive brain. There are excessive amounts of activity in the central cortex and other areas of the brain. Type 7. Anxious Attention Deficit Disorder People with Anxious Attention Deficit Disorder have high levels of activity in the basal ganglia that aid in making dopamine. This differs from the majority of the other attention deficit disorder types, 
which have low activity in this part of the brain. It is possible to have more than one of these types of attention deficit disorder. For example, a common combination is overfocused, limbic, and anxious types. Now look at extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the monologue of a physician giving a lecture on scleroderma. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, doctor. Could you please explain different types of scleroderma? Well, scleroderma is a symptom of a complicated group of diseases by an abnormal growth of connected tissue that supports the skin and internal organs. This disease is also termed as systemic sclerosis. Scleroderma literally means hard skin. Derived from the Greek words sclerosis, meaning hard, and derma, meaning skin. Scleroderma is considered both ruminic disease, since the conditions are characterized by inflammation and pain in the muscles, fibrous tissues or joints, and a connective tissue disease. Certain types of scleroderma have a limited abnormal process that primarily makes the skin hard and tight. Other types are more complicated, affecting the internal organs, such as the lungs, heart, and kidneys, and the blood vessels. A phrase identified as softening occurs, during which less collagen is produced. There are two main classifications of scleroderma. Localized scleroderma, that affects only certain parts of the body, that includes linear scleroderma and morphia, and systemic sclerosis, that affects the entire body. Localized scleroderma. Localized scleroderma affects the skin and related tissues, and, at times, the muscles below. However, internal organs are not affected. Localized scleroderma can never advance to the systemic type. Moreover, localized types can improve over time. However, the skin changes that occur during the disease can be permanent. It may be serious and disabling. Morphia. Reddish patches of skin that thickens into firm oval-shaped areas are distinctive characteristics of the morphia type. The centers of the patches appear ivory with violet borders. The patches occur on the stomach, chest, face, back, legs, and arms. 
Typically, these patches sweat a little and have little hair growth on it. Morphia can limit to one or several patches, ranging from a half inch to 12 inches in diameter, or else it can be hard and dark, spreading over larger areas of the body. Morphia generally fades out in about five years. However, people can have permanent dark skin patches and muscle weakness. Linear scleroderma, characterized by a distinctive single line or band of thickened, abnormally colored skin. Typically, the line runs down an arm or leg and can run down the forehead. Systemic sclerosis not only affects skin, but also involves blood vessels and major organs. Patients with systemic sclerosis often have all of the following symptoms, known as Kress syndrome, an acronym for calcinosis, formation of calcium deposits in the connective tissue, Reynolds phenomenon, small blood vessels of hands or feet contract in response to cold or anxiety, esophageal dysfunction, Impaired function of the esophagus occurs when smooth muscles in the esophagus lose normal movement. Sclerodactyly. Thick and tight skin on fingers result from deposits of excessive collagen within skin layers. Calangiectasias. Small red spots on the hands and face are caused by swelling of tiny blood vessels. Systemic sclerosis is further divided into two categories called limited and diffuse. Typically, limited scleroderma has a gradual onset and is restricted to certain parts of the skin, such as hands, fingers, lower arms, face, and legs. Often, Reynolds phenomenon is experienced for years before skin thickening becomes evident. Calcinosis and calangiectasias often follow. At times, limited scleroderma is referred to as Crest syndrome because of the predominance of Crest symptoms in these patients. Typically, diffuse scleroderma has a sudden onset. Skin thickening develops quickly and covers much of the body in a symmetric pattern. Most of the internal organs can be damaged. Skin can swell, appear shiny, and feel itchy and tight. The damage of diffuse scleroderma occurs over a period of a few years. After a period of three to five years, patients tend to stabilize, a phase when progression of the disease seems little and symptoms subside, but gradually. Skin changes begin again, a phase identified as softening occurs, during which less collagen is produced and the body rids of excess collagen by itself. This is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test.